I know that today's topic might bring up a number of questions from you. So you may type your questions in chat box and I want to let you know that we will address as many as we can in the time we have today. And I welcome and request Professor Dr. Raghunath Krishnappa to start this session. Welcome, sir. Over to you. Thank you, sir. Very good morning to all of you. At the outset, I would like to thank National Board of Examinations and uh, Dr. Soma Shekhar for giving this opportunity. Uh, without wasting much time, we would move on to discuss the renal cell carcinoma. I would be discussing only the renal cell carcinoma. Very rare types of RCCs I would not be covering because this itself is a very big and vast topic to cover in 45 minutes. Okay, I will be touching upon the practical and relevant points from early stage disease to advanced stage RCCs, right? Coming to epidemiology, as we know, most of the cancers are prevalent in men and RCC is not an exception. So male to female uh, ratio is 1.5 to 1 and most common in the 6th to 8th decade. That means after the age of 50 up to 70 years, it is very common. And peak incidence is in 6th decade. That means between 50 years and 60 years. We see 30% of our patients, at least in India, they present with metastatic disease. And even if they present with localized or locally advanced disease, eventually most of them would develop metastasis. The commonest metastasis is to lung, liver, bone, and even distant lymph nodes. Supracracular so lymph nodes is one of the commonest uh, uh, presentations sometimes. Adrenal meds, even opposite adrenal gland, brain meds, and even opposite kidney we have seen, and very rarely soft tissue metastasis is also reported in RCC metastasis. Whereas most sporadic RCCs are generally unilateral and generally unifocal, Stage of diagnosis is the most important prognostic factor. Why I say this is, if you come across stage 1A disease, that is very small uh, tumor in the kidney, just by doing partial nephrectomy, you can cure. The extreme end of the spectrum is a metastatic disease, stage 4 disease. It is generally incurable, but with the advent of newer drugs, we can control even stage 4, four disease uh, we can give a very good quality of life and even uh, number of years can be added to their life. The predominant histological type is adenocarcinoma, which is arising from the proximal convoluted tubulum and uh, PCT, that is tubular epithelium. And when it comes to adenocarcinoma subtypes, there are various pathological subtypes are there. I would not go into the details of the, those things. All the theoretical aspects, probably better you refer to Divita. Uh, and other guidelines, NCCN guidelines. What clinically relevant, I'm going to tell you, the clinical relevant cancers are clear cell RCC that we see in 75 to 85%. Papillary RCC is the next commonest, which we see in 10 to 15%. And the third is chromophobe carcinoma, 5 to 10%. Sarcomatide and sarcoma, I would like to tell you, specify here, sarcomas are different from RCC, right? It is not renal cell carcinoma. Sarcoma is a different type. Whereas sarcomatoid carcinoma, sarcomatoid variant of RCC is nothing but grade 4 or very aggressive type of RCC. There are various other subtypes like collecting root carcinoma, medullary carcinoma, which are very, very aggressive. They generally present with metastasis. I would not discuss and dwell upon those things because of paucity of time. Coming to the risk factors, you know, commonest risk factor for any cancer nowadays is tobacco and RCC also uh, happens because of tobacco. The second other uh, commonest risk factors are hypertension, which is very prevalent in our society. Even hypertension is very common in, even in 30s and 40s. So that could be one of the risk factors for uh, development of RCC. The another important risk factor, which uh, we all should know it's a modifiable risk factor, that is obesity. By increase in BMI of 5 factor, every increase in 5 BMI 
almost 24% increase in risk of developing RCC in men and 33% increase in RCC in women have been reported. So obesity is very important parameter. When you are counseling the patient, person with RCC and obesity, these are very important. Urban environmental toxins, cadmium, exposure to asbestos, even petroleum products where they are working in petroleum industries, they are relatively at a higher risk of developing RCC. High dietary fat intake is also associated with the uh, increased incidence. Acquired cystic renal diseases from renal failure, those who are undergoing uh, dialysis because of end-stage renal disease are at risk of developing acquired cystic diseases maybe over a period of 8 to 10 years when they are undergoing dialysis. There are many associations with uh, uh, one hippal lindo disease. I would not dwell upon this thing. These are the other subtypes, loss of 3P and other things which I will not go into the details. Coming to the pathology, if you see small renal muscles, generally they are all round and wide. Even T2 masses, which is 7 to 10 centimeter masses, are generally round and wide. There can be some extensions here and there, particularly at the pelvic cell system, because the resistance offered by the pelvic cell system for its spread would be relatively less. Circumscribed by pseudo capsule of a compressed parenchyma and fibrous tissue, which is generally a hallmark of clear cell variant. I am telling here, clear cell variant has a better pseudo capsule which also has a clinical and surgical implications. Whenever you get a good pseudo capsule, even if you do enucleo resection or unicle enucleation, uh, that would suffice. Whereas, you should be very vigilant whenever papillary RCC is there. The pseudo capsule is deficient, number one. Even if it is there, the tumor can probably sometimes penetrate the capsule. So if you do enucleo resection or enucleation in papillary RCC, chance of having margin positivities and chance of recurrence will be relatively high compared to clear cell RCC. When it comes to nuclear features, formal grading system is there. Actually, formal grading is described only in clinical and only in clear cell RCCs. But some pathologists would extrapolate that to even other subtypes. But initially, originally, it was described for clear cell RCC. It varies from grade 1 to grade 4. Grade 4, some pathologists call it as sarcomatoid. That is the difference between sarcoma and sarcomatoid variant of RCC. Diagnosis. Small renal masses, what we call small renal masses means it's a different entity. These are various definitions are there. Less than 3 cm or less than 4 cm. Generally less than 4 cm. Uh, we call it as small renal masses. This fall into T1A. TNM classification. They are generally asymptomatic. They don't come with any symptoms, but mostly detected by ultrasound examination. When they go for ultrasound examination because of vague abdominal pain or even sometimes vomiting, which may, may not be related to this small renal mass, they pick up. Okay. So this has earlier internist tumor now has become radiologist tumor, right? Common signs and symptoms generally seen in large tumors, T2 tumors or T3 tumors is hematuria, which is seen in 80%, flank pain in 45%, flank mass in 15%. This classical triad is described in the textbook, which we see in less than 10% of the uh, population because ultrasound is available everywhere. If they have small, uh, you know, any vague abdominal pain, generally they go to uh, get the ultrasound, which is available readily in India, so they pick up these masses. There can be weight loss, anemia. Anemia is generally normochromic or normocytic anemia most of the times. There can be polycythemia very rarely. They can present with isolated fever. Only isolated fever after doing radical nephrectomy or after removal of the tumor, the fever settles. So you will be puzzled to solve how, what is the reason for fever. after given treatment to RCC, sometimes fever can subside, uh, which is which comes under paraneoplastic uh, symptom. There can be isolated weight loss. We see cachexia in uh, RCC patients, which is not very common. The less common signs and symptoms are hepatic dysfunction without metastasis to the liver. That is called Stafford syndrome. You read about Stafford syndrome in detail. 
I am not going to cover the theoretical aspects of all these things. I am just going to give you a practical, a clinical perspective. Polycythemia is another less common symptom. Hypercalcemia occurs in 25% of patients with metastatic disease. That is stage 4 disease will have 25% hypercalcemia. When it comes to paraneoplastic syndrome, which we see in 10 to 20% of our population, these are the uh, symptoms are what we see uh, in the laboratory findings. Elevated ESR, hypertension, anemia, cachexia, weight loss, pyrexia, abnormal liver function, hypercalcemia, polycythemia, very rarely neuromyopathy and even amyloidosis have been reported with RCC. How to diagnose these things? Generally, we do CBC, liver function test, creatine, calcium and urine analysis should be good enough uh, for the evaluation. Whereas, identification or diagnosis happens by imaging. We don't diagnose by lab tests. So, imaging, ultrasound is the commonest imaging modality we employ, which is readily available. If any detail, you know, defect is found, if any suspicion is there, then we move on to CT scan abdomen. This is generally contrast and CT scan. Sometimes if IVC involvement is there, to ascertain or to understand the level of IVC thrombus, we may have to go for MRI of the abdomen. For metastatic evaluation, metastatic evaluation you generally do not do for early stage disease. If the tumor is large in the kidney, maybe more than 7 to 10 centimeter, uh, in such cases you do metastatic evaluation. CT scan is reported is given in the textbooks but CT scan is not a very good modality. Whenever you suspect uh, metastasis, commonest metastasis is in the lungs, better to go with CT scan of the chest. Bone scan is again reported but it may not pick up subtle small tumors. So MRI brain is required only if clinically indicated. If patient is symptomatic of brain meds then we go for MRI. FDG PET CT is uh, you know, not according to the guidelines, but in clinical practice, we utilize FDG PET CT because it's one investigation. It can detect brain meds, bone meds, and even the lung meds, which will also form a baseline investigation to compare at a future date. PET has equivocal findings on conventional uh, imaging, and PET scan is not used to detect the primary disease because FDG is excreted in the pelvic cell system, it cannot differentiate primary uh, tumors. So, PET scan is generally required for metastatic evaluation in clinical practice. The percutaneous renal biopsy or aspiration has a limited role, particularly in Indian scenario. If you go through the Western literature for, for small renal masses, they advocate uh, percutaneous renal biopsy. You get a core biopsy, coaxial core biopsy, the chance of having benign lesions is around 15 to 20%. But in our clinical practice, uh, we have our own data, uh, multi-centered data from various centers from uh, India for small renal masses that is less than 4 centimeters. We see in less than 2%. So, any small renal masses in India, 98% of the times they are malignant. That is the contrast uh, between uh, Western literature and Indian literature. This is the HSCC staging, TNM classification. I would not dwell upon these things for the paucity of time. Uh, you please read up uh, in your textbooks. This is distant metastasis and anatomic staging and prognostic groups. Coming to staging of the RCC, there are four stages, T stages particularly. Stage T1 is less than 7 centimeters. In that, again subdivided into T1A and T1B, 4 centimeters is the cutoff. Because biologically, they behave, if they're less than 4 centimeters, they behave differently. More than 4 centimeters, they behave differently. Even risk of having metastasis in less than 4 centimeters is extremely rare, maybe less than 1 to 2 percent. However, that risk increases when it is uh, more than 4 centimeters. That's why. T1A is less than 4 cm and T1B is 4 to 7 cm. Stage 2 is 7 to 10 cm but confined to the kidney. It has not gone outside the capsule of the 
kidney that is stage 2 stage 3 is involvement of the regional lymph nodes renal vein or even vena cava or sometimes even the renal sinus fat infiltration is also called stage 3 disease or once the tumor goes outside of the capsule of the kidney is stage 3 disease stage 4 or t4 disease is involvement of the adjacent organs adjacent organs generally are adrenal uh, colon on both the sides can be involved very rarely duodenum is involved but extremely rare and this again stage 4 for metastatic rcc also we call it as stage 4 disease prognostic factors various prognostic factors are the stage grade of the tumor histological subtype sarcomatoid histology that is very aggressive variant that is uh, grade 4 uh, formal grading is sarcomatoid histology tumor necrosis when you see on CT scan if tumor necrosis is there that's one of the poor prognostic factors so while deciding type of surgery whether lymphadenectomy is required or even treatment is required we take into account all these parameters grade of the tumor histological subtype sarcomatoid variant is there or not stage of the tumor and tumor necrosis and site of metastasis is also important lung meds carries different prognosis compared to bone meds and even brain meds and liver meds burden of the metastasis low volume versus high volume or solitary metastasis or oligometastatic disease versus polymetastatic disease it carries entirely different prognosis prognosis whereas patient related factors are also there it depends on the performance status of the patient if the performance status is good, their immunological status is good, they do better. Symptomatic presentation. If they are symptomatic, generally they do poor. And constitutional symptoms are not very relevant because once you remove the tumor, constitutional symptoms will come down. However, if cachexia is there, that's one of the poor prognostic factors. Paraneoplastic syndromes and metastasis free interval is also important. You have done a T2 tumor surgical resection radical nephrectomy have done and the, if the metastasis happens maybe 10 years down the line then it carries a better prognosis than having a metastasis within six months to one year in the literature the metastasis can happen even up to 35 years you have done radical nephrectomy to detect the metastasis after 35 years because rcc is an immunological tumor you must have seen spontaneous resolution of the metastasis which is seen in less than maybe 0.5 percent which is also seen in melanomas because it's an immunological tumor if the immunity of the patient is very good preferably younger individuals they have a better prognosis their chance of spread and their chance of developing metastasis can be delayed by increasing their immunity by various means when it comes to laboratory prognostic parameters anemia thrombocytosis, hypercalcemia, elevated ESR, elevated alkaline phosphates, and even CA9 expression is also one of the important prognostic factors. Coming to the management, I'm just going to give you a overview of stage 1 to 3 and stage 4 disease. Then I'll move on to uh, particular subtypes or particular, you know, or stage of the disease for further understanding. Generally, Partial or radical nephrectomy is required for stage 1 to 3 disease. Uh, for definitely for stage T1A disease, partial nephrectomy is indicated. In selected patients with T1B and even T2 tumors, uh, partial nephrectomy is indicated. It can be done by either open laparoscopic or robotic. Nowadays, robotic surgery is become very popular for partial nephrectomy. Even in T2 disease or T1B disease, Many surgeons would prefer to go for radical nephrectomy by either open or laparoscopy. That is easier. If it is possible, better to preserve the nephrons by doing partial nephrectomy. Why it is very important, I would probably explain in my subsequent slides. According to EAU guidelines, many surgeons does radical nephrectomy by open means. It is not recommended. If you are doing radical nephrectomy for even B tumor or T2 tumor, laparoscopy is recommended or minimally invasive uh, approach is recommended because it reduces the morbidity. So open radical nephrectomy is not indicated by all these guidelines. So we should be doing 
either laparoscopic or robotic. Robotic may be expensive in India, at least laparoscopy, one should learn and one should do to reduce the morbidity. Is it possible to spare the adrenal gland? In most of the tumors, it is possible to spare the adrenal gland. Maybe 75% we can spare. If a lower polar tumor is there, say 7 cm, 8 cm tumor, you don't need to remove the adrenal gland unless the CT scan is showing enlargement of the adrenal gland. Radical nephrectomy and IVC thrombectomy may be required in case of uh, T3 B disease. Radical nephrectomy and RPLND. RPLND, I am here telling uh, retroperitoneal lymph node dissection is not indicated with a curative intent in all the patients. Whereas, when you are doing radical nephrectomy, always get perihilar lymph nodes uh, because if involvement of the perihilar nodes are there, the prognosis is poor. And there is some evidence for adjuvant therapy, I will discuss later. So, sampling of the perihilar lymph nodes are very, very important for prognostication. If large nodes are there, say 2 cm nodes are there, 2 3 lymph nodes are there, one can even do RPLND, formal RPLND. It is not to cure, it is for better prognostication. Very small subset of patients, maybe less than 7 to 8%, can be cured even with. RPLND, if theoretically speaking, if the disease is confined only to the lymph nodes. However, general consensus says that if lymph node involvement is there, they will have metastasis. Okay. It's a theoretical possibility. If metastasis is not there, the disease is confined only to the retroperitoneal lymph node, one or two lymph nodes. By doing RPLND, formal RPLND, uh, there are no standard templates. But if you do, you know, template RPLND, probably you can cure small subset of patients. But there is no level one, level one evidence to suggest that RPLND is going to be curative. Adjuvant therapy may be required in selected cases. Uh, there is some evidence now, even FDA has approved pembrolizumab for adjuvant therapy. Uh, it is required in locally advanced disease with perinephric fat invasion and adrenal invasion. IVC or renal vein extension alone does not increase the local recurrence chances. In case of high grade disease or higher stage disease and lymph node involvement, probably adjuvant therapy can be considered. Role of adjuvant immunotherapy, a recent keynote trial showed that pembrolizumab is going to enhance the life expectancy. Uh, before this keynote trial, there was a STRAC trial where sunitinib has been used uh, by Pfizer. They conducted this trial. They showed that there is some advantage of 8 months survival advantage if you start adjuvant sunitinib in patients with higher risk disease, higher stage disease. I would like to touch upon positive surgical margins when we are doing partial nephrectomy. Say you have done for 4 cm tumor, you have done partial nephrectomy. If during surgery itself, if you come to know that grossly margin is positive, we have gone through the tumor. In such cases, probably you can do redo partial nephrectomy if it is possible and feasible or radical nephrectomy is also one of the options when gross margin is positive and recognized during surgery. If microscopic margin positivity, you have done good partial nephrectomy, you have seen during surgery that you have not violated, but finally histopathology comes as microscopic margin positivity may be less than 1 millimeter. You have to observe, you have two options, doing radical nephrectomy and observation. I would suggest observation because in such cases there are series wherein margin positivity was there, microscopic margin positivity of less than 1 to 2 millimeter is there. When they have done radical nephrectomy, assuming that oh, they have left behind the tumor, in 94% of the cases, the tumor was not found in the kidney. So, because of this, don't jump into the conclusion that we have to remove the kidney. 94% there was no tumor. You can observe, you can very well inform the patient. In case of recurrence, probably you can go for radical nephrectomy. That's one of the options. When it comes to stage 4 disease, uh, cytoreductive nephrectomy, we used to do before Carmina trial. Carmina trial has showed that cytoreductive nephrectomy is not required for all the patients. It's only in good risk patients. IMDC or MSKCC, low risk patients, probably they benefit from cytodirectory nephrectomy. 
along with systemic therapy. Whereas in case of solitary metastasis, say solitary rib met or solitary met which is found in the lungs or liver, probably you can excise and you can give even sometimes cure or uh, disease-free interval can be achieved by doing metastasectomy. Uh, no role of cytoreductive nephrectomy in the intermediate and high-risk disease. This is very clear. You don't have to remove the kidney whenever intermediate or high-risk uh, metastatic disease is there as per the IMDC and MSKCC risk certification. Systemic therapy, we have been using interleukin-2 in the past, interferon alpha and combination. High-dose interleukin-2 was one of the standard options a couple of years back. Uh, as the, that was the only uh, drug which was giving, uh, you know, cure up to 10%, but it had a lot of toxicity. We used to give uh, in the ICU setting, admitting the patient in the ICU and administer that. This had even morbidity and mortality because of capillary leak syndrome, they used to die. Whereas now, uh, we have very good VEGF inhibitors and immunotherapy which is available now so we don't go for uh, into the high dose interleukin 2 when it comes to the targeted therapy or wedge inhibitor we have sunitinib axitinib and bosopinib which gives uh, very good results and now we have immunotherapy recently from a couple of years uh, nivolumab plus ipilimumab combination gives very good results even up to recent trials 25% complete resolution of the metastatic disease have been noted with this combination uh, at 30 months. And when you give pembrolizumab and axinib combination, uh, al almost 11% complete resolution is seen at 24 to 30, 30 months of uh, therapy. So we have very good treatment options for stage 4 uh, RCC, which was not available earlier. When it comes to rare clinical situations, the focal palliation uh, may be required for metastasis disease. Uh, radiotherapy alone can be utilized for painful bony meds and even brain meds. And metastasectomy may be required for solitary, as I told you, and combination may be required in some cases. Chemotherapy generally is not required uh, for very rarely for collecting red carcinoma, medullary carcinoma. We may give gemcitabine, uh, plus or minus 5 fluorouracil and uh, capacitabine. Various combinations can be given. Uh, not enough data because uh, these collecting the carcinoma and medullary carcinoma uh, of the kidney are relatively rare. It's very difficult to come out with any trial to uh, suggest which is the best drug. Coming to different management of, uh, uh, you know, different stages of the disease. This is whatever I have given so far is the overview of RCC. Now I will move on to the specifics of uh, management of small renal masses. How to define small renal mass? These are incidentally diagnosed asymptomatic renal masses of less than 3 cm, some say less than 4 cm. Okay, earlier we used to call this an internist tumor, now it's radiologist tumor because invariably these are detected by radiologists when they do ultrasound. Wide range of management options are available. Tumor size is one of the most important prognostic factor, as I told you earlier. Less than 4 cm and more than 4 cm, a lot of differences are there biologically and even the outcomes are different. These are generally incidentally detected, 60% by ultrasound, done for various other reasons unrelated to this mass. Is biopsy required in these patients? According to Western literature, uh, because they say 20% of their small renal masses are benign. However, in India, we don't advocate biopsy. There are no standard guidelines for this, but in India we don't do biopsy because 98% of our tumors are malignant tumors. When it comes to pathology, as I told you, if you take Mayo Clinic, more than 2,700 patients, around 20% were benign if the size of the lesion is between 3.1 to 4 centimeter. Even UCLA uh, study of more than 500 patients, around 14% were benign if the tumor is less than. Uh, 4 cm. What are the treatment options for these small renal masses? Radical nephrectomy is generally not recommended. We have to preserve the kidney. That to open radical nephrectomy is should not be done. Whereas very complex tumor, 
hilar tumor where partial nephrectomy will be different or difficult and a lot of complication when you expect probably you can do radical nephrectomy only in selected cases of small renal masses uh, and you have to go with laparoscopic or any minimally invasive approaches whereas for small renal masses standard of care is nephron sparing surgery or partial nephrectomy you can do by open method laparoscopic or robotic robotic is very common nowadays for uh, nephron sparing surgery it has become almost like a you know standard of care uh, for partial nephrectomy because because of excellent vision and dexterity of the instruments the complications are less than open surgery or even laparoscopic surgery we call it as trifecta effect or pentafecta i will not get into the details of those things those can be achieved best with robotic surgery there are various other options like cryoablation rfa hifu or even cyber knife uh, these are all considered right now experimental whereas hifu is fda approved recently couple of years back in some cases small renal masses if 80 year old person comes with a 2 cm lesion in the kidney is if his life expectancy is say more than 4 to 5 years generally active surveillance should be good enough because the growth of these tumors are generally 2 to 4 mm per year if a 2 cm lesion can grow to 4 cm probably it takes 3 4 years in such cases probably active surveillance should be good enough however active surveillance does not mean that you don't treat you need to observe you need to evaluate periodically you need to do imaging to understand the growth kinetics accordingly you plan treatment for them uh, before contemplating nephron sparing surgery or partial nephrectomy we need to understand the indications approach uh, with open laparoscopic or robotic how much of margin is very important earlier we used to go with 1 cm margin couple of decades back then it reduced to 0.5 cm then millimeters now the standard of care is pathologically negative margin should be good enough that's why enucleation has come up in a big way because if you do enucleation of the tumors particularly clear cell rccs you are going to preserve more nephrons the complications are less because you are going to not going through the uh, vessels and pelvic cells in system you are going to go very close to the uh, pseudo capsule of the tumor you are going to remove the tumor with negative margins and without complications and you are going to preserve more nephrons that is becoming standard of care however you should be very careful if you violate the capsule or if the capsule is infiltrated by tumor chance of recurrence will be there so it's a double edged sword you need to be very vigilant while choosing enucleation versus enucleate resection so margins are very important oncological outcomes i'm going to discuss oncological outcomes of partial nephrectomy is definitely equivalent or superior to radical nephrectomy how much preservation of the renal function if a large tumor is there even if you do partial nephrectomy at least 20% of that kidney should be preserved then only it should be uh, it should function normally you consider 50 50% of function by both the kidneys at least on one side 20% function should be there and you should also uh weigh the pros and cons of uh, preserving the kidney versus removing the kidney i will get into the details of this why we should preserve the kidney what are the types of nephron sparing surgery there is polar resection enucleation wedge resection excavation or enucleate resection enucleate resection is becoming standard of care for small renal masses that to with uh, robotic uh, you know approach is there any functional advantage of doing partial nephrectomy this is very important uh, most of the surgical oncologists they used to do radical nephrectomy for, for small renal masses there is enough evidence to show that partial nephrectomy is superior to radical nephrectomy why we should be doing partial nephrectomy because of the risk of ckd that is chronic kidney disease how do we define ckd if the creatinine is more than 2 mg per deciliter we call it as ckd so chance of developing ckd with radical nephrectomy is higher compared to partial nephrectomy so how much of difference is there at 5 years 15% of radical nephrectomy patients can develop ckd whereas 0% would become 
CKD with partial nephrectomy. What about at 10 years? At 10 years, if you do radical nephrectomy, almost 22% of them can become CKD. That is, creatinine will be elevated at more than 2. Whereas with partial nephrectomy, you are going to preserve nephrons, the chances are almost 50% less at 10 years. Why it is very important? Why should we preserve the kidney? Why should we uh, maintain the creatinine to less than 2? These are the implications. The new onset decrease in the GFR. Normal GFR is 100 to 120. When we do radical nephrectomy, many a times, the GFR falls to less than 60. You see, GFR with partial nephrectomy will be preserved more. With radical nephrectomy, it would reduce to less than 60. It can even reduce to less than 45, uh, more with radical nephrectomy. So radical nephrectomy causes significant decrease in GFR, significant loss of nephrons, compared to partial nephrectomy. Why it is very important, GFR is very important, or kidney function is very important. And what are the implications of CKD, that is chronic kidney disease? Risk of death, CV events, and hospitalizations are significantly more if the creatinine remains at more than 2. To prevent CKD, partial nephrectomy is to be done if possible and feasible. The number of deaths from any cause, you see here, the GFR, as it reduces from 60 to towards 15, the risk of death increases. You can see here, the GFR as it, the GFR reduces, the risk of death is more. Risk of cardiovascular events are also more if the GFR falls to less than 60. And 25% risk of cardiac death post-radical nephrectomy if they develop CKD. The number of hospitalizations are also significantly more if the GFR reduces to less than 60. So you need to preserve the GFR. To preserve the GFR, you need to preserve nephrons. To preserve nephrons, you have to do nephron sparing surgery, not radical nephrectomy, if it is possible and feasible. Many a times, when I was in, I used to think, why I should not do radical nephrectomy? If I am not capable of doing partial nephrectomy, I should be referring the patient we should be doing justice to the patient so that experts can do partial nephrectomy. So radical nephrectomy is not the choice if I don't know how to do partial nephrectomy. Coming to ablative techniques, RFA, cryotherapy, high four and cyber knife. Uh, these are right now experimental. So I would not dwell upon much on this where you're going to uh, cryoablate the tumor by inserting a needle either by percutaneous or laparoscopic means. This is RFA, uh, the tumor ablation. These are very attractive options in uh, very selected patients. Uh, this is considered investigational as of now. There are even various other uh, technologically different uh, modalities are there. Radio surgery, that's cyber knife, microwave thermotherapy, laser and interstitial uh, uh, thermotherapy, or even chemo ablation have been tried, but these are all experimental at this point of time. Active surveillance, I told you, uh, it is uh, required in some of the elderly patients who, who are not suitable for surgical therapy, whose life expectancy is relatively less. Because when you do, when you contemplate surgery in such patients, the morbidity will be less. I mean, morbidity will be more. In such cases, you contemplate uh, active surveillance. The EAU guidelines on localized RCC, very strong recommendation is there that offer partial nephrectomy to patients with T1 tumors. Don't do radical nephrectomy. Offer partial nephrectomy. If you are doing radical nephrectomy, it should not be open. It should be laparoscopic, at least minimally invasive. To summarize small renal masses, increased detection of incidental tumors which are higher. Uh, we detect smaller and smaller tumors very frequently and these are generally low grade uh, with a low malignant potential. The options are better to excise and nephron sparing surgery is becoming standard of care, standard of treatment and we get complete histology with this and we are going to cure. Open or par robotic partial nephrectomy is widely used. Ablative techniques are experimental at this point of time. Definitely try to avoid radical nephrectomy to reduce the risk of CKD and its consequences. Role of surgery. For I, I covered rule of surgery for T1 A lesions, nephron sparing surgery. Let us talk about T1 B lesions. Should we do partial nephrectomy for T1 B tumors and T2 tumors? 
let us discuss and also locally advanced tumors. There is strong recommendation to offer laparoscopic radical nephrectomy for T2 tumors. Do not perform minimally invasive radical nephrectomy in patients with small tumors. If you cannot do partial nephrectomy, at least send them to you know, centers or surgeons who are doing partial nephrectomy, even by open method. Okay, partial nephrectomy, even if you do by open method, it's fine. Don't do uh, radical nephrectomy, either by open or even laparoscopic. T1B tumors, these are the tumors we are talking about. These are 4 to 7 centimeter exophytic tumors. It is possible to do partial nephrectomy. The cancer specific survival, even if you do partial nephrectomy for T1B tumors, is superior compared to radical nephrectomy when they were matched with stage to stage, grade to grade, necrosis and histological mm -hmm. subtypes. The cancer specific mortality is again, it is in favor of partial nephrectomy at 5 years and 10 years. And nowadays, utilization of partial nephrectomy for even T1B tumors has increased. From 2000 to 2008, almost 16 percent of more surgeons were doing partial nephrectomies. In 2016, almost 25 percent were doing more partial nephrectomies for T1B to preserve the nephrons. The complications, urological complications of partial nephrectomy are relatively more than radical nephrectomy. However, non-urological complications are more with radical nephrectomy. So, partial nephrectomy is a complex reconstructive surgery. It involves cutting through the parenchyma and pelvic cancer system and reconstruction of the same. So, experience and skills are needed to perform partial nephrectomy uh, is relatively high compared to radical nephrectomy. So, try to acquire these skills and try to pass on this benefit to the patient by doing partial nephrectomy. The role of neoadjuvant therapy is coming up in a big way because we have very good tyrosine kinase inhibitors and immuno-oncology immuno -oncology drugs like pembrolizumab and nivolumab uh, where even large tumors can be reduced in size and you can probably plan for uh, nephron sparing surgery. These are particularly required in uh, patients with chronic kidney disease where kidney function is already compromised or uh, in a solitary functioning kidney. One kidney is non-functioning or poorly functioning. The other kidney has a tumor. In such cases, probably you can utilize neoadjuvant um, targeted therapy. These are the cases wherein these are solitary kidneys. Opposite kidney has been removed. Whereas directly, it's very difficult to do partial nephrectomy on these cases. In such cases, probably you can utilize neoadjuvant therapy to reduce the size of the tumor. Uh, and the best effect of reduction in size can be achieved in clear cell RCCs. So, required in uh, patients with chronic kidney disease where kidney function is already compromised or uh, in a solitary functioning kidney. One kidney is non-functioning or poorly functioning. The other kidney has a tumor. In such cases, probably you can utilize neoadjuvant uh, targeted therapy. These are the cases wherein these are solitary kidneys. Opposite kidney has been removed. Whereas... Directly, it's very difficult to do partial nephrectomy on these cases. In such cases, probably you can utilize neoadjuvant therapy to reduce the size of the tumor. Uh, and the best effect of reduction in size can be achieved in clear cell RCCs. So, you have to do biopsy first, confirm it's clear cell RCC, then you go for this neoadjuvant options. So, these for locally advanced RCCs. Uh, I would not dwell much upon these things. Venous thrombus either renal vein or IVC thrombus, nodal disease or adjacent organ invasion, your neoadjuvant therapy can be tried in all these things or upfront surgery can be tried. The surgical technique for IVC thrombus, preoperative embolization is not very popular but if facilities are available only for IVC thrombus patients, not for T1 or T2 disease, uh, there is no role of embolization. Only for locally advanced or IVC thrombus patients, probably you can try preoperative embolization. Uh, incisions are midline incision, chevron incision or even makuchi incision gives very good exposure. Makuchi incision means it's a curved incision starting from xiphy sternum, go up to the umbilicus and take a lateral turn toward the apex of the 12th or 11th rib. Sternotomy may be required in uh, level 3 and level 4 thrombus but try to avoid sternotomy if possible to 
prevent the morbidity. Some surgeons, even supra diaphragmatic uh, uh, IVC thrombus, they just make a nick in the make opening in the diaphragm and milk out the thrombus, put it down, and apply a certain ski clamp to avoid sternotomy. These are various types of uh, you know chaotomy uh, and resection of the tumors. Sometimes, if bland thrombus is there, we may have to use greenfield uh, filter. Uh, just above the thrombus to prevent migration of the bland thrombus and causing pulmonary embolism. If tumor is causing complete obstruction to the IVC, probably we can transect the IVC or we can ligate the IVC because they would have developed collaterals. So by ligating or even transecting the IVC, uh, we have done a couple of cases of excision of IVC where infiltration of the IVC was seen. We have excised the segment of IVC because uh, already collateral should have been established, no other consequences. So, even if you excise, nothing will happen in such cases. For level 1 thrombus, this is how you are going to manage. You have, this is a level 1 thrombus in the right kidney. You are going to clamp here, opposite renal vein and clamp above the thrombus and you are going to remove. Even this can be done for even level 2 thrombus. Okay. So, and releasing the clamp, always you should release in the opposite direction. You release the first clamp above, above the, uh, you know, thrombus, opposite renal vein, then you release the below the thrombus IVC. So, applying from below upwards and releasing from above downwards. Thrombus level 3, uh, I would not dwell upon these things because of paucity of time. I will move on. Tumor thrombus level 4. Uh, veno venous bypass may be required. Cardiopulmonary bypass may be required. Uh, with hypothermia is definitely better. There are a lot of advantages with uh, hypothermia. Bloodless field will be there. Up to 60 minutes of ischemia time can be tolerated. Outcomes of tumor thrombus. Potentially, we can cure up to 70% of patients even if level 4 thrombus is there. Management of nodal disease with M1 disease. Uh, this is not standard of care, there is no level 1 evidence, but some surgeons have, uh, you know, adopted these templates for radical uh, RPLND, retroperitoneal lymph node dissection in selected patients. Role of surgery in adjacent organ invasion like this, definitely even if adjacent organ invasion is there, by doing radical nephrectomy and excision of that, by giving a negative margin, you can give survival advantage. For T4 disease, Natural history not defined very well. Uh, role of curative or debulking surgery, we don't know. But definitely we should be doing surgery in such cases because we have very good systemic options. Is there any role of neoadjuvant therapy in locally advanced disease? Yes, there is a role. We already we have discussed, same thing can be employed. Summary, aggressive surgical dissection when feasible remains the best treatment for renal cell carcinoma. Role of targeted therapy and immuno-oncology drugs, particularly pembrolizumab and nivolumab, in an adjuvant or neoadjuvant setting can be uh, utilized and it definitely gives better survival advantage. If used as a neoadjuvant therapy, surgical dissection can be easier. So management of locally advanced disease remains a surgical challenge but can be associated with excellent outcomes. When it comes to metastatic RCC, surgery is generally not required. Either cytoreductive nephrectomy may not be required in all cases, only is required in low risk uh, IMDC criteria. Sometimes radical nephrectomy with solitary metastasis, removal metastasectomy, gives a cure advantage, or at least disease free intervals can be increased. RT has a palliative role for painful bony meds and brain meds when it comes to metastatic RCC. The standard of care is tyrosine kinase inhibitors plus immuno oncology drugs. Um, combination. This nivolumab plus ipilimumab gives 25% complete response in 30 at 30 months, whereas pembrolizumab and axidnib gives 11% complete response at 24 to 30 months. Thank you. I am happy to take up any questions. We have 11 more minutes left for question and answer session. I am happy to take up any questions. Thank you. Uh, Raghu, thank you very much. That was a very, very good comprehensive, uh, nice coverage and more than that, you know, you really told a lot of uh, good uh, uh, guidelines uh, because these are asked in exam. If you do partial versus uh, nephrectomy at five years, what is the uh, 
uh, CRF rate and at the end of it. Uh, so there are questions in the uh, chat box. Uh, so if you can answer them, I'll ask. Uh, what are the precautions? Manish, uh, our student has asked, sir, what are the precautions to be taken to avoid tumor embolism? Uh, I believe that probably if he meant if it is touching the renal vein, if there is a thrombus, otherwise tumor embolism is not an issue. Yes. So maybe in that context, yeah. Yeah, uh, you are absolutely right. So you are not going to prevent tumor embolism by doing partial nephrectomy. If it is already there, you should not be doing partial nephrectomy. Except there are very case re few case reports. In a solitary kidney, if thrombus is there in the renal vein, are you going to do partial nephrectomy? No. Oncologically, it is not safe to do uh, partial nephrectomy when the tumor is infiltrating the uh, branches of the renal vein. In such cases, better to apply neoadjuvant therapy reduce the size of the tumor, then uh, you can uh, make them amenable for partial nephrectomy. Good. And uh, Ritam Shah has asked, you know, this is always asked in our exam when we have a specimen afternoon because I am examiner for both MCS surgical onco and DNB surgical onco. Uh, when we have this specimen of RCC, we always ask, what is the current uh, uh, accepted role of elective retroperitoneal lymph node dissection in RCC? Uh, to be done, not to be done, when it is clinically N0. When it is clinically N0, when CT scan is not showing any lymph nodal enlargement, classical RPLND is not recommended, period. Whereas, very hilar lymph node dissection, around the hilum, you need to remove some of the lymph nodes for prognostication. It is not RPLND. Peri hilar lymphonectomy is not called classical RPLND. You are going to remove peri hilar lymph nodes whenever you are doing radical nephrectomy for prognostication because there are a couple of adjuvant treatment options are there. Now FDA has approved pembrolizumab when, say for example, if you remove 5-6 lymph nodes around the hilum, if one node is positive, okay, they have high risk of recurrence. In such cases, probably you can consider giving pembrolizumab or sunidinib which can increase the survival. So it's only for prognostication. It is not to cure. Just by removing 5-6 lymph nodes, you are not going to cure. Even if lymph nodes are enlarged, by doing classical RPLND, I told you, uh, classical RPLND may cure small subset of patients. Maybe 7 to 8%. That's it. Correct. So, you know, uh, students, you must remember, but now all high-risk RCC tumors, the tumor with thrombus or sarcomatoid variety, if it is available, or if you apply uh, many prognosticators, including MSKCC, which is for metastatic. And then if nodes are positive, adjuvant TKS in selector select patient is recommended. So it may not be therapeutic, but definitely it will help you to reduce the local recurrence as well as do a better staging so you can prognosticate them. However, if there are positive nodes, then it's a part of site reduction, then uh, good lymphadenectomy there. It may not be a classical template RPLND. But the paraiotic between the hilum is important. Yes. So, in group of patients, uh, they are asking, should we go for upfront cytorectal nephrectomy without TKS? I mean, suppose there is a metastatic disease at presentation. There are two options. Either to give TKS, absorb, and then to look at primary versus cytorectal metastatomy. But which are the case, even though it may be metastatic, stage 4, we would prefer surgery first followed by TKS. Yes, very important question, uh, Dr. Somo. Thank you for asking this uh, very good uh, pertinent question for uh, post there is. If a small lesions are there in the lung, T2 tumor or T3 tumor is there in the kidney with multiple, maybe uh, 0.5 or 1 centimeter, 3, 4 tumors are there in the lung, they fall into low risk category. Low volume metastatic disease is there. In such cases, probably you can go for upfront cytorheductin nephrectomy. When you are contemplating upfront cytorheductin nephrectomy, that always implies that after cytorheductin nephrectomy, you are going to give systemic therapy. So, such cases. If multiple bone meds and lung meds are there, in such cases, probably cytorheductin nephrectomy will not have any role. Okay, you should differentiate cytorheductin nephrectomy versus palliative nephrectomy. Palliative nephrectomy is to take care of the symptoms. If they have bleeding, you are doing radical nephrectomy. You are doing palliative nephrectomy. Palliative nephrectomy is to relieve the pain or to prevent hematuria. Okay. Cytoreductive nephrectomy is different from palliative nephrectomy. Absolutely. You know, uh, I also invite students. Uh, there is a practical consensus guideline for management of metastatic RCC. 
uh, and what are the role of surgery which has been authored by many of us and i was also one of the expert panel it is published in south asian journal of cancer please go back and read role of surgery in metastatic rcc and in exactly uh, you know what uh, ragu told me remember if 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 the majority of the 95% of the tumor is in the primary area not systemic or there a component of oligometastasis as told you can go ahead and do it or you can do a stage manner there is one more question uh, from lalla uh, lala gladson what are the contraindication for partial nephrectomy because in this era almost most of the patients are eligible for partial nephrectomy so what would be the standard contraindication a student should say in exam uh, there is no contraindication for uh, partial nephrectomy if you feel partial nephrectomy can be done you should be doing partial nephrectomy period okay there is no standard contraindications no like uh, like uh, uh, bulky systemic you know no, no, no. The high That's level what, if it is feasible if it is feasible or possible Okay, even if bulky tumor is there, T two tumor is there, ten centimeter tumor is there in the lower pole, you can still do partial nephrectomy. No, like thrombus. If, if there is thrombus in the IVC and uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah. then it, then it is. Uh, I mean, you cannot do partial nephrectomy with a negative margins, right? So it is not feasible. It is not contraindication. It is not feasible. In general, uh, if you read the data, T four lesions. and then thrombus in uh, vena cava and uh, you know ivc this yes, is in such cases in such cases uh, you cannot do partial nephrectomy they are contraindicated so not be doing partial nephrectomy you can say it is contraindicated but in a solitary kidney what are you going to do only one kidney is there with a thrombus in the segmental renal vein with a 6 cm tumor you can still try neoadjuvant therapy reduce the bulk of the tumor you can still contemplate partial nephrectomy by doing partial nephrectomy in solitary kidneys you can avoid dialysis to some extent you can postpone development of ckd okay, okay? otherwise if you remove the kidney what are you going to do he has to be he has to go for uh, you know uh, dialysis and maybe 2 years or 3 years down the line if there is no metastasis he has to go for renal transplantation ఫ్రెంట్స్టిఫైడ్ uh pre operative ct angiogram or now we have even 3d uh, models can be developed we can understand the vascular anatomy and uh, tumor anatomy and kidney anatomy in a best possible way pre operatively we can plan how to do partial nephrectomy in such cases uh, should be tried yeah manish is asking suppose uh, the option was is a open surgery for renal cell carcinoma Uh, say radical nephrectomy if there is no minimal access uh, expertise or facility then transperitoneal is right way or is it a way, retroperitoneal flank better in a malignancy uh, my first answer to that is if you do not have laparoscopic surgery if you don't know laparoscopic surgery please send them to a person who is doing radical nephrectomy that's my first answer second transperitoneal versus retroperitoneal it, it it is not going to change the management okay however uh, if you are well versed with transperitoneal you can do transperitoneal otherwise you can do flank approach retroperitoneal not much difference uh, for students uh, by and large uh, uh, remember that if you can do transperitoneal good because the lymph node clearance will also be good you can take a good margin but however it also depends on the t size because most of the based on t size you would do partial nephrectomy and only if you think it is not amenable for partial nephrectomy because of the size anatomy location uh, or various other contraindication uh, then uh, you do lap but by and large if a tumor is more than 10 to 15 cm initially people used to think that you know you should not do minimal access but still you can do a minimal access back yes. assessment and it out through supra pubic uh, penile stain still the patient will have a benefit of minimal access initially it was debated that if the incision to remove the kidney mass is same as the incision required to do the surgery then why do it but remember it with retraction so the same thing can be avoided back then you can bring it out through penile stain in a minimal access nature
Yes, absolutely. Because ferrous steel incision, you are not going to cut the muscles. If a flank incision, you are going to cut the muscles and sometimes even the nerves. So, morbidity is relatively more. Another point I would like to highlight here is, uh, in the retroperitoneal approach, your access to the artery will be direct. You can go to the artery and you can ligate directly. If you go transperitoneally, uh, vein will come first. You need to look for artery because doing radical nephrectomy, you need to ligate the artery first, then the vein. You cannot go directly to the vein. So with this approach, some difference will be there. There is one more question. Uh, nowadays, most of the renal cell carcinoma in all uh, institutions is a robotic partial nephrectomy with a pneumoperitoneum. So, intratumor spillage during partial nephrectomy, how do we manage this? Uh, unless you are going to give a negative margin, spillage does not happen because of pneumoperitoneum. If spillage is there, if you go through the tumor or a cystic tumor is there, if it ruptures and the fluid comes out, if that fluid contains malignant cells, definitely there are high chance of developing local recurrence in the peritoneum. So, basically you avoid tumor spillage. Uh, there is no, if you prevent the tumor spillage, if you give negative margin, there is no risk of local recurrence or even peritoneal seedling. Yeah, presuming it happened because of various reasons, manipulating the kidney, soft tumor, capsule got rupture, there is a spillage. Uh, unfortunately, currently there is no adjuvant treatment in that because we know there is no role of uh, radiation or chemo in RCC and there are no uh, evidence or publication of giving uh, TKIS if there is a tumor spillage. You just give a wash and come, they retain higher chance of return recurrence. Uh, yes, uh, you are absolutely right. Uh, what we do in such cases, there are case reports where you can give distilled water. Distilled water can be tumoricidal in some cases. Give a thorough lavage. You can do radical nephrectomy, remove all those spillage sites and give a uh, thorough wash with uh, distilled water. Leave distilled water for some time. And some case reports of even using uh, uh, you know, hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide can also uh, kill cancer cells. If you suspect some spillage, probably you can use either distilled water or uh, hydrogen peroxide. There is another question, uh, Robin has asked, so when do we advise genetic screening in patients with renal masses? Is there any differences in the management in them? See, for students, I want to say, when you ask etiology in exam, you have to say three C, 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 C. C, cigarette smoking is number one. Second C is genetic causes, one equal lento syndrome. Third is cadmium exposure. So, if you see bilateral renal, papillary variety, multiple, you should really think of... Uh, this. So, I'll, I'll let Raghu answer this. So, when should we do recommend genetic screening in a patient with renal mass? Excellent question. I would appreciate for asking this question. Genetic screening is required for any small renal masses or any tumors if it occurs in less than 40 years, number one. Number two, any family history of tumors, either VHL or even without VHL, we see uh, you know, familial carcinomas. In such cases, genetic evaluation is required. So, Banu Prakash is asking, so suppose there is a patient who is medically inoperable. So, no matter what happens, so can he be left alone or can he be put on TKS without removing the renal mass? Yes, if he is not a surgical candidate, either active surveillance or tyrosine kinase inhibitors are there, even immuno-oncology drugs are there. Okay, if he is not a surgical candidate, you have to probably employ these two options. There is... Uh, because pembrolizumab and nivolumab are very expensive nowadays, you can, uh, the generics of even TKs, that is tyrosine kinase inhibitors are available, which are very cheap. Probably you can try one of those. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Sandeep is asking, sir, in exam, one line, if I have to say margin for partial nephrectomy, can we tell single cell line or one millimeter? It's uh, histopathologically negative margin should be good enough. And macroscopically, while doing like a robotic ultrasound guided, what are the margin we achieve to achieve uh, histologically negative margin? So, in fact, when you do robotic partial nephrectomy, you get in optical magnification. You can increase to digital magnification by four times. That is 40x. You get magnification. Okay. So, 40x is similar to light microscopic examination. So, earlier we used to send the specimen for margin positivity or negativity. Frozen section we used to do for small renal masses to say 
the margin is positive or negative and we used to take deeper margins if it is positive margin so with robotic in us they have stopped doing all this uh, you know frozen sections because your magnification is so good you can make out during surgery whether you are going through the tumor or not but in the theory exams you must always tell that you send it for frozen section if the frozen section comes positive you need a deeper resection so that is required okay uh, varun is asking uh, how does the rcc with ifc thrombus involving wall infiltration manage varun you just excise the wall that's all you can take a wall and suture it back if through and through is there rarely you can put a graft uh, am i right raghu uh, yeah uh, if 50% of the wall can be preserved 50% of the circumference you don't need to put a graft if you are going to excise more than 50% probably you need to put a graft that's number one infiltration of the ivc infiltration of the ivc carries poor prognosis than the level of the thrombus whenever infiltration is there it carries poor prognosis even in such cases you can probably excise a segment of ivc if the flow is not there in the, that part of the ivc you can simply excise ivc nothing will happen because collaterals would have formed by then absolutely then uh, you know there is a question by sandeep sir in the class in the lecture you told that clear cell carcinoma we mean get away with any clation papillary carcinoma needs more than any clation yes so but how do we preoperatively know this because usually there is no biopsies in the rcc so how do we know it is clear or papillary to take that element very good question now mris they can probably predict whether it is rcc or not or whether it is clear cell or papillary now we have even radiomics we are coming with the artificial intelligence technology pre operatively we can decide uh, uh, we will come to know what is the type of tumor histological type of tumor uh, with the advent of mri and ai technology it is possible to know pre operatively what is it number 1 number 2 many a times in the west they do pre operative biopsy if the pre operative biopsy is either clear cell or papillary you can decide accordingly Uh, Allah, uh, there are so many questions, but you know we may have to. It Asim is asking, uh, sir, uh, evidence based. Which are the condition where we would recommend uh, a pre-operative biopsy in a patient? Because it's not a norm, but which are the condition where we may have to do it? Yes, there are a uh, few conditions like lymphoma. It's already diagnosed case of lymphoma. If small tumor is there, chance of having lymphoma will be very high. That's number one. Number two, metastasis. See a breast, see a thyroid. uh ca colon all these things can throw meds okay if small lesion is there in such cases uh, you should always do biopsy to confirm whether the pre tumor in the or meta cells these are the two conditions or thank you other other condition would be if you are suspecting a benign tumor like oncocytoma okay you don't need to do partial nephrectomy or radical nephrectomy in such cases probably uh to decide the treatment you can do biopsy thank you thank you very much raghu so many questions are pouring in that shows that you know how much students are hunger in this knowledge probably i may have to request you to come again couple of months later for next particular session uh you know as i always say all good things has to come to an end and the purpose of teacher and mentor is not to spoon feed but to you know stimulate their mind show the path and the student has to walk in raghu has given beautiful so many useful insights and now you need to expand and yourself students you have to go back and understand read and expand on this knowledge that is the purpose of teacher we just enlighten show the path and give an ideas into your mind and then you need to walk that path and expand on that thank you very much raghu warm hearted uh, you know thanks from dnb board student and myself uh, for spending valuable time and you know sharing your knowledge for the benefit of students thank you very very much thank you dr somu excellent interacting with you thank you thank you over to navneet singh ji thank you very much dr ragunath krishnappa for the presentation and thank you very much professor dr somu shekhar for joining and thank you trainees and faculty members for joining thank you thank you